Hey, AP Biology people, here we go. Chapter three, molecules of life. Um, chapter two was some basic chemistry there. And you should know about atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, ionic and covalent bonding. Uh, there's a Kahoot after you read that chapter, so make sure you get that done. This rolls us into chapter three, which is about four major macromolecules. Organic chemistry, let's go. All right. So carbon is the stuff of life. In terms of all the elements that uh, make up us and all other living things, plants, bacteria, fungi, your dog, your cat, whatever, after hydrogen and oxygen, carbon is the most abundant living thing, uh, a most abundant element in living things. Oftentimes, life on Earth is considered to be carbon-based life forms. We're organic. The molecules consisting primarily of hydrogen and carbon atoms. We are organic. Uh, I'm sorry, those molecules that have hydrogen and carbon atoms are organic. There we go. And then carbon can form covalent bonds with one, two, three, or even four other atoms. If you look at the periodic table of elements, you see that carbon actually at atomic number six fits under the column, what's called column or group 4A. And because it's in group 4A, all those elements, whether it's, uh, I'm pulling down my periodic table real quick, carbon, silicon, germanium, Tin, lead, they're all in group 4A, which means they have four electrons on the outside, four valence electrons. And consequently, they can they need four more uh, because eight fills the outer shell. Eight makes atoms happy, and that's why they form bonds with other things, um, as we learned in chapter two. All right. Um, so they can form up to four bonds with others, even itself, and can form chains or ring structures, which you'll see. So here's a carbon atom. Six protons in the middle, six neutrons in the middle, two electrons fill the first shell, and after that, up to eight, the carbon, since it has six protons, has six electrons as well. Atoms are electrically neutral. So six positive protons, and then six electrons in the electron cloud on the outside. And you can get carbon to form methane, CH4, and it's these four, I'm sorry, these uh, eight on the outside, these are just the valence electrons drawn in this dot diagram. There are other ways we can look at this as well, the structural model. Um, and then if you're gonna build a model, the ball and stick model, this tries to represent more of a three-dimensional model because it is three-dimensional, right? So here's your planetary model that you're filling in in the notes. Here is your electron dot diagram that shows the shared electrons. So they're covalent bonds. Here's a structural model. You can draw this one here, go back. And so these lines represent a pair or two shared electrons. Um, you don't have to draw this one, but here's your ball and stick. No, you don't have to draw that one either. But we do wanna write the formula for glucose and what that looks like. So glucose is C6H12O6. Don't draw this one. That's a little too complex. Here's a couple different ways to look at it. This is the simplest, and this is kind of chemistry shorthand. The little O over here stands for oxygen. But then each point of the hexagon, one, two, three, four, five, those are all carbons. Then we got, of course, another carbon coming off of here. So this is super chemistry shorthand, super shorthand for glucose. Please draw this. You might have to press pause in the presentation. Draw this where it says glucose on your notes there. Um, and notice the orientation of the hydrogen versus the hydroxide ion, H, O, H, O, H, 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 O, H. And then here, you can just write shorthand, CH2OH is fine. Uh, if you built these molecules uh, with a little uh, chemistry set, you would see each of these coming off. So draw that one. Memorize that one. Sweet. All right, so let's get into a little more detail here. Um, functional groups are clusters of atoms covalently bonded to a carbon atom of an organic molecule. They impart or they give specific chemical properties, polarity, acid, acidity, or basicness, or non-polarity, right? You don't have to memorize all these, but as we go, you're going to see that these are, uh, hopefully you'll see this as somewhat familiar. Uh, phosphate groups, you're definitely going to see in the DNA and the RNA when we look at nucleic acids. The amines are found with amino acids. They make proteins, so you see nitrogen there. Uh, but carboxyl groups, you'll see, and then also hydroxyl groups, you'll see quite often. You'll certainly see some of these other ones here for sugars, uh, but for mo the most part, you're gonna see the OH, which is our hydroxyl group, one of carbohydrates, um, and then the amine and the phosphates here we'll talk about later. But those functional groups attach to other hydrocarbons to kind of confer some sort of specific characteristic. 
Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that take place in your body here. So I'll write down the word metabolism, and it's the activities by which cells acquire and use energy as they construct, rearrange, and split organic compounds. Enzymes are required. A condensation reaction is when two molecules covalently bond into a larger one. Sometimes they call this, I'm going to go back here, um, sometimes they call this a dehydration synthesis reaction. Dehydration synthesis because you have water molecules coming out uh, when you bond a couple of molecules together. So usually an H from one molecule and an OH from another molecule come off and those form together a H2O water molecule. And then the two remaining molecules are then covalently bonded. They share those electrons. Cleavage is another way to say cutting or splitting. Cleavage reactions split large molecules into smaller ones. And then we can also, like if condensation is known as dehydration synthesis, putting together, if we're breaking apart, the addition of water can break things apart. So hydro refers to water and lysis, lyse means to break. So using water to break apart larger molecules. And then the terms monomer and polymer. Mono, how many is that? Mono is one, right? And poly is many. So if you take small parts, subunits, to build larger polymers. All right. So here's condensation reaction. This would be taking, uh, looks like, you know, these molecules. A glucose and a glucose. So you have two glucose molecules. Also note that they're one, two, three, four, five, six-sided. So this is kind of a hexagon or a hexose sugar. Later on with nucleic acids, you'll see a pentose sugar or the ribose or deoxyribose sugar that we have. But anyway, this is a pentose sugar. And if we take the OH hydroxyl group off of this sugar and the HIN off of this sugar, then the O can bond to this H and this side. What comes out is an H2O molecule. So in this condensation reaction, this is why we can also call it a dehydration synthesis molecule. Go back. I'm sorry that happened. Thanks for your patience. Here we go. Also call this a polymerization reaction, and that sounds big and fancy and maybe scary. Polymerization is a big word, but basically it's just the act of making a polymer. So you're taking two monomers and you're making a polymer, a longer chain. So polymerization, fancy, right? In hydrolysis, hydrolysis, this is water breaking. So if we introduce water, that can help chemically split to, uh, in this case, these were disaccharides, but here it looks like it indicates a poly, a polymer. So we can split a polymer apart here by uh, fitting in that hydrogen and oxygen, the H2Os. All right, moving on. Carbohydrates then are one of the major groups uh, of organic compounds, carbon compounds. We call them macromolecules. Carbohydrates are organic compounds that consist of a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen in a ratio of one to two to one, or at least really close. The classic example is the glucose that you already saw, which is C6H12O6. That's a one to two to one ratio of C's, H's, and O's. Carbohydrates in general, if you think about them, uh, what kinds of foods do you eat that contain a lot of carbs, a lot of carbohydrates? Breads, pastas, potatoes, french fries, of course, cookie dough, cookies, something like that, and even uh, candy, sugar, right? Those are all carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the main source of energy, or at least fast energy, for living things. Monosaccharide, that's one big word. Monosaccharides are the monomers, the small parts that make up the big polysaccharides. And I'm jumping ahead here a little bit. Oh, we'll go back. Monosaccharides are one sugar unit. They're the simplest, a five or a six carbon backbone. They've only got one ketone or aldehyde functional unit and two or more of those hydroxyl groups, those OH uh, negatives there. Um, oligosaccharides, this is kind of in between. Uh, mono and poly. So this is a short chain of covalently bonded monosaccharides in case in this fact, or I'm sorry, in fact, what we have right here is the sugar that we generally like to eat. Sucrose is a disaccharide. Um, it's the candy that's usually, or I'm sorry, it's the sugar that's usually used in candy. It's the type of sugar that we generally find in fruit. And so it's kind of interesting, evolutionarily, humans generally always prefer sucrose. You can eat glucose. You can eat other disaccharides like maltose. But sucrose tastes the best. And so here we would have to do hydrolysis to break this apart to get just the glucose molecule. So our mitochondria, powerhouses of the cell, can, uh, can use the glucose to make energy for our bodies here. Okay, so mono is one. Oligo is a couple, a few, a short chain. Then we get the polysaccharides here. This is a complex carbohydrate. Uh, you might have heard of cellulose, glycogen, starch, chitin, maybe not some of these. Uh, cellulose is found in the cell walls of plants. So it's like the most common 
Uh, well, check your book. Is it cellulose or is it starch? That's the most common um, polysaccharide on earth. Glycogen is one that's found in our bodies. And so this is kind of cool. Uh, in terms of homeostasis, maintaining balance, you know, like your temperature, your 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, you maintain that temperature. If you get cold, your body shivers. If you get hot, your body sweats. You want to maintain that temperature because that's the optimal temperature for our enzymes to function, for our body to function. Well, if you eat too much sugar, your body pumps out a bunch of insulin, a hormone that comes from your pancreas, kind of over by your stomach. And that insulin puts a bunch of monosaccharides, glucoses, together in these long chains. So there's one glucose, two glucose, three, four, five, six, a long chain of glucose. And what happens then is that glucose is no longer available for your body to kind of freak out and feel like it has to metabolize or your mitochondria to use. And then later, if you don't eat a lot of sugar, another insulin, or I'm sorry, another, not insulin, another hormone, I'm sorry, glucagon, kind of is the opposite of insulin. Glucagon uh, can be produced to come out and actually break off right there or right here, break off those different individual monosaccharides, the glucoses, to become available to use again then. So another example of homeostasis, how your body works, your pancreas producing insulin to form long chains, the polysaccharide glycogen, or if you need more sugar readily available, uh, your pancreas produces glucagon, a hormone that comes along and breaks each individual one off there. There's a starch molecule. All right. All right. Lipids, a new category. So you've got carbohydrates. you got lipids. Lipids are also known as fats, oils, and waxes. Generally, we say lipids store energy. But I tell you what, waxes on the plant cuticles, the surface of plants, sometimes plant leaves look shiny. They've got what's called wax on top there. That's a type of lipid, right? And it, it works to hold water in kind of stop evaporation, or more specifically, transpiration, which is water evaporation for plants. Um, ducks also have a preen gland, and geese do too, really all waterfowl, uh, kind of back by their butts. And if you watch them sometimes, you can actually see them bend back with their beak and kind of nibble what it looks like there. But they're getting a little bit of this wax from their preen gland, and then they preen, and they rub that wax all the way through uh, their wings and uh, their body, and then they become more waterproof, see? Uh, but lipids generally are fats. They can be used for um, uh, heat retention as well, kind of insulation. Um, but usually we say uh, they store energy. So lipids are fatty oil, fats, oils, or waxy organic compounds. They're insoluble in water. Water's polar. Remember that uh, polar covalent bond of water, oxygen and the two hydrogens in H2O. Oxygen takes more of the shared electrons and consequently is negative. And the opposite side, the hydrogen side, is positive, and that's what a polar molecule is. That explains why lipids, which are not polar, do not separate, do not mix, and consequently they stay separate, right? So they're insoluble in water. Lipids, fatty acids are simple organic compounds with a carboxyl group, functional group joined at the backbone of anywhere from a four to a thirty-six carbon uh, chain of atoms, right? Fats that are lipids with one, two, or three fatty acids that dangle from a smaller alcohol glycerol. So generally, we talk about triglycerides, and here's what it looks like. Here's your glycerol connecting with a bunch of dangling uh, fatty acids here. Look at all the water coming out. Um, if you do the synthesizing macromolecules lab in class, you literally see this happening with your, with your part, uh, parts that you put together there, right? And so it can become fat tissue that's like that. Uh, one tricky thing is I know I've been saying monomer, polymer. That terminology works really well for carbohydrates, and you'll see that it works just fine for as well as nucleic acids. But really, monomer polymer doesn't quite work with lipids because we just have two major components. You have glycerols and you have fatty acids, none of which are really monomers. I guess these are all small parts that make up the big part, triglyceride, but let's go on. All right, more about lipids. Phospholipids, we'll learn a lot more about when we talk about cell membranes in the next uh, two chapters in your book, four and five. Cell membranes are basically this sea of phospholipids. You've got a polar head with a phosphate tail, uh, double tail, and two nonpolar fatty acid tails. I'm sorry, the, the polar head is phosphate. And then you have two um, fatty acid chains or tails that come off, um, and it's double layered. We'll look more about cell membranes later on in chapter four and five. Waxes, if we're looking at lipids, are complex varying mixtures of lipids with long fatty acid tails bonded to long chain alcohols or carbon rings. They're tightly packed so that the, they act firmly to repel water. Like I mentioned, plant cuticles, feather waterproofing, honeycombs made out of wax. Steroids are another group of lipids. 
a rigid backbone of four carbon rings and no fatty acid tail. So there's a cholesterol. It's a type of steroid. Here's our uh, phosphate head and lipid tails of the phospholipids, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was mentioning before. And like I said, in chapter four and five, we'll learn that the cell membrane, which this diagram is trying to mimic, shows kind of a double layer of phospholipids. So we'll get a lot more into that later on. Sweet. Proteins. Here's a third group of macromolecules or large molecules. Um, organic compounds composed of one or more chains of amino acids. Here now we see carbon, hydrogen, and now the introduction of nitrogen with the amino acid group or carboxyl group and amine groups. Polypeptides are the polymers. So the monomers are amino acids and the polymers are polypeptides, chains of amino acids coded by DNA. Proteins are the most diverse group of macromolecules. There are way more types of proteins, different kinds of proteins, than there are carbohydrates, lipids, or nucleic acids. Um, some proteins work for structures, like as in spider webs, feathers, hooves, hair, uh, muscles primarily. Uh, bones are made with a lot of protein as well. Uh, some proteins are nutritious. You can get energy from like seeds, eat, uh, eggs, and meat. Um, some act as enzymes, which we're going to have to get into more detail later on. Enzymes are a specific group of proteins uh, that speed up chemical reactions. And then some uh, proteins also move substances, help communicate, help defend the body in terms of immune system. Your antibodies are like proteins. So proteins, there's a lot of different kinds of things going on there. We look at proteins. Um, the, poly, the polymer is the polypeptide. But then that polypeptide is actually folded into a multiple, uh, multiple fold sometimes. And that folding of the polypeptide leads to what we officially call a protein. So in proteins, the monomer are the 20 amino acids. The polymer is generally said to be the polypeptide. But then that polypeptide is folded. So the primary structure is just that sequence of amino acids, also known as a polypeptide. The secondary structure, and there's a video coming up, hang tight. The secondary structure is when we kind of make these first folds of that sequence of amino acids. Then there's usually a tertiary, and there is a tertiary structure, which is kind of a secondary fold, which creates these domains. And not only the sequence of amino acids, but actually the folding, the shape of the protein, actually allows it to do what it's supposed to do in terms of chemical reactions, uh, like hemoglobin uh, reacting with extra oxygen. In your book, if you read that, they give you an example about how that kind of works, and that hemoglobin can actually become denatured and no longer accept oxygen, and that causes all sorts of problems. If you heat up an egg, like crack an egg into a frying pan, you've got the egg yolk and you got the egg white, but it actually starts out pretty clear. And then as it fries and cooks, it becomes white. Um, at a molecular level, you are changing the shape of those proteins. They call it denaturing, denaturing the proteins. And they can't go back to the way they were before. If you have a high fever, it is possible that your high fever could start to cook or denature your enzyme proteins. And consequently, all sorts of problems are going to arise. If you get way too hot in your body, those enzymes might misshapen and no longer function. And then you can't have chemical reactions carry out fast enough. There often is a quaternary level of protein structure as well, which is basically two tertiary proteins kind of intertwined, working together. Two or more polypeptide chains that are bonded. Hemoglobin is an example. Keratin fibers in your skin. Actin and myosin in your uh, muscles. Those are all at that quaternary level of structure as well. So you click on this, you're going to have to maybe click on it. Does it work for us? How long is it? There we go. All right. Why are protein structures so important? Again, check out page 46 in your book, and you can read about one wrong amino acid and the problems that that leads to, the wrong shape. I mentioned the term denature. This is protein shapes unravel and no longer function. 
Our fourth and final macromolecule group, nucleic acids. Here we're talking DNA and RNA. The monomer, the small group, the monomer that makes the polymer, these are the nucleotides. We'll talk a lot more about nucleotides, DNA, and RNA when we get into our genetics unit. But for now, let's say that the nucleotides are the small organic molecules, various kinds of which function as energy carriers, enzyme helpers, chemical messengers, and subunits of DNA and RNA. ATP is a type of nucleic acid, adenosine triphosphate. Again, a big word, but later on, we're going to talk a lot more about this, so you'll become a lot more familiar with ATP and ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. But triphosphate, how many phosphates? Three. It's the outermost phosphate group transfers and primes reactions. ATP is kind of like our main energy currency. To get anything done, uh, you know, in the world, maybe you need some money. Well, to get anything done with your body, you need some ATP. Nucleic acids, these are the polymers. So generally we're saying RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, or DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, here is one, as I'm outlining, one nucle uh, nucleotide. Here's another nucleotide. So how many do we see here total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, held together by hydrogen bonds. So then you put a bunch of these nucle nucleotides together and you can get that spiral staircase, that double helix, that DNA structure. 